Oh, hi, Anima. I'm very well. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm delighted to interview you today about the Influence Workbook and yes. also talking about, you know, fulfilling dreams and becoming successful in the fashion industry and also in life. It's really delighted. Please tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, wow. Um, where do I start? <laughs> well, actually, I am a, a consultant, a speaker, and a coach uh, based here in New York City. And um, also, I'm the executive assistant to Fern Malice, who is the creator of New York Fashion Week and also an author of, of the book that you mentioned here, The Influence Workbook. And it specializes in teaching people um, keys and exercises to help trajectify your life. Um, and it becomes your blueprint for success, which kind of speaks to what I believe is my personal mission, which is also my brand statement, building people for global influence. That's awesome. I don't know how you manage all of that. Um, <laughs> plus, I know that you also do a lot of public speaking, uh, especially you said that you were recently in, um, was it Indiana, speaking with yes. some young um, fashion professionals there. Yes, yes. I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana for the Making It in Fashion initiative, and I was the um, first keynote speaker for the first uh, live installment of um, this particular initiative that the Indiana Fashion Foundation has started. And I'm really excited about that because Indiana is actually launching their first fashion week um, this June coming up. And so uh, I was there to to be a part of that. And it's a really interesting story as far as how that happened. I don't want to really get into all of that today because it'll, it'll take a little time to tell you all of that. But um, speaking of, you know, influence, people are always watching you. And I believe that one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring out with the book that I published was to remind people and help people to connect with that it factor that they have that is their ability to influence their particular audience because I believe that all of us have uh, the ability to influence those who we are assigned to or those who we are you know divinely connected to I would say and um, just because of that in, in doing that um, and just being um, and going about my, my regular routine of just being me uh, I was able to connect with the woman um, whose name is Denisha Ferguson, who is starting uh, Indiana Fashion Week, and it all happened because of an Instagram post that I did, and that developed a whole <laughs> Indiana Fashion Week, and so it's really interesting when you get into the details of it, but those kinds of moments are what makes up what I do. So we have some guests with us, uh, some people crying out that they love Elliot Carlisle. We have Iskra perez Oh, Salcedo, hi, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. She's in Charleston, South Carolina, where I used to live before I moved to New York. Iskra, how are you? Wonderful. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this journey from Charleston mm -hmm. to New York. And mm -hmm. then also would love to hear a little bit about your personal uh, journey and how you landed in fashion. Why fashion? Oh, my gosh. Well, well, that kind of takes me to Charleston, to New York. So I'll start there from the beginning to answer that question. I, you know, my background was in music. You know, when I started out, um, you know, just as a kid, um, I played piano and I sang and I did that in elementary school and I was in plays and did that in middle school. I was in the show choir and the performing groups. And then, um, you know, in high school, I did the same thing. So when it when it was time for me to graduate from high school, you know, the question was, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to do music. I don't know anything else. It was all I had done, you know, all my life. I ate, slept and breathed music. And so, um, you know, it just kind of made sense, you know, and then of course I was offered music scholarships, which really made sense to what I was doing. Um, so I just took that and I did that and, and did that my first year. And then my second year, I just kind of went through this phase where I no longer wanted to do music. And, you know, it, I realized that it was serving other people, but it wasn't serving me. And so what other people enjoyed about music from me, I wasn't enjoying for myself. And um, I actually just decided to drop out of school and I forfeited my scholarship. And, you know, my parents were very supportive. You know, my dad was just like, well, you're not going to just sit around the house. you got to figure out what you're going to do. And I had no clue. I honestly did not. Um, and then so I just took the summer to, you know, kind of figure it out. But during that time, I had done my last project that I did in my business intro to business class um, that I'd taken. I had done a marketing plan for a fashion magazine. And so I had started to do some research and we, you know, those were in the MySpace days and I had made all these connections with people in the fashion industry via MySpace. And so I 
I was still connected to them, even though my project was over. And I saw as we started approaching September, people started talking about this fashion week. And, you know, everyone was all excited about it. And I constantly saw it in my timeline. And so, you know, it just sparked this curiosity. And I was like, I want to go to fashion week. I want to check it out. And so I did. I saved my money. I booked a ticket. I came to New York and, you know, I went to Fashion Week, so to speak. <laughs> I was here for Fashion Week, but I really didn't get into any shows because I didn't know that you just couldn't go. I, I really thought I'd tell this story all the time. I thought it was like a Broadway show. You buy a ticket and you go to a show. I had no clue that you actually have to be invited or, um, you know, who was invited and why they were invited. I was just lost on all of that. And so I learned. And, you know, just to give you the B version of the story, I ended up coming back home. And um, the next season, I went back as a volunteer. And my first day working on set as a volunteer, I was hired uh, to be a production captain uh, for Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week. And so all the years at Lincoln Center, I did uh, production for the New York Fashion Week shows. And that was my foray into the fashion industry to see the whole industry at work from behind the scenes and all of the different parts that go into what makes a fashion show. Because many people, you know, they see this, this monumental moment that takes place for seven minutes on the runway. But the work and the the crews and the staff that it takes to put on those shows, many people have no clue how much it takes uh, to produce those events. And so I really started getting interested in what the PR people were doing. And so I just learned it for myself. And I went back home and I started my own freelance uh, PR and events company. And I did that uh, for a number of years. And then in 2012, I decided to go back to school to get my degree. And I went to, uh, I moved to Charleston to go to the Art Institute of Charleston to get my degree in fashion marketing and retail management. And I graduated in 2015. And then it was figuring out, you know, what I was going to do from there. And then in 2017, uh, Fern Malice, who I had become I'm friends with in Charleston, she decided uh, she actually uh, lost her assistant. Her assistant was moving on to another position, and she reached out to me for help. And I and I, you know, based on the timing and what was going on, I said, well, you know, I can come and help you with this. And so then I moved to New York, and, and the rest is history. <laughs> so it's really interesting in your story. You talk about that you know you were doing music, and then the music didn't serve you anymore. And then yeah. you decided to change. And that's really a little bit about your book and about this tool that you've created for people to also, mm -hmm. you know, nail down and discover what is their message. Would you talk a little yes. bit about the book? And uh, mm -hmm. also, you mentioned that this book is a result of your own journey and your own yeah. process. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, because, you know, and many people, they hear my story and they're like, wow, but how did you, I mean, it's really interesting how you navigated, you know, to be here. But the thing is, and, and I've heard um, Fern say this all the time, and it really, it really always makes me smile because I say this too. You know, you, one of the hardest things to do is plan your life, right? Life is just full of surprises. It throws you all kind of inconsistencies. I mean, you just never know what's behind, you know, door number one, door number two, door number three. So that's, so because of that, you know, it's kind of hard to actually just completely detailing plan your life out. So one of the things that I've just always known is moment by moment, how am I supposed to respond to this moment? Um, I believe that every moment we always have a choice. We always have a decision that we can make. Um, and, and knowing that using wisdom to make the right decision based on what you know your purpose is or based on what you know your goal is or what you're trying to accomplish. So for me, because I've always been a person who's very sure of, number one, who I am and what my purpose was, um, you know, and what I wanted to do and where, where I was going to go, I always took the time to really look at that for myself so that when moments of decision came, I could make the decision that was going to move me forward toward my destiny and not backward or, or that which would become a distraction. Um, now, as a human, we don't, you know, I'll just master that you know I have my own you know mistakes and pitfalls and shoulda coulda wouldas as we say but for the most part intentionally that is the way that I move so in all of that and getting here there are some things that I learned along the way um, that actually work and just in me being a voice to people and being a speaker and a consultant I found that the things that I would share and teach about my journey people were would really pull on and be like you know you should put this in a book or you should do a class on this or you should do a workshop on this and so over time I did implement the classes I did implement the workshops and then finally I implemented you know worksheets and the worksheets became so in-depth that I found that people really needed something a little bit more intense but also something that was a little bit more um, uh, how would I say 
action item and and that left you with some tangible takeaways and so I said well let's let's do a book I mean it just at this point and it had been asked of me for years but I never would do it and this book I didn't plan to publish publicly I think I shared that with you I only plan to use it as internal material for my boot camps but uh, when I got to New York there was such a demand for what I was teaching and saying it from people that I said I need to go ahead and get this book out one of the questions that I have is, what is the point of developing, you know, this personal mission statement? I know that um, Stephen Covey has says it in the, um, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. You mm -hmm. mentioned that your book also helps define that. But yes, how does part. that help you be successful or what does it have to do with? Um, your business or moving forward with, you know, where you want to go professionally? Because it helps keep you on target. It helps you keep, it helps to keep you focused. I think one of the things that um, I find in my coaching, talking to people that a lot of times people, you know, will get involved in things or start, you know, to invest in things that really have no connection to their true desires, their true wants, or, you know, who they are inside. Um, but they find that, you know, I'll just do this because it's for the moment. I'll just do this because somebody said I should do this. Some people have said I should do that. But, you know, people really haven't taken the time to find out and, and solidify and identify for themselves what exactly do I want in life? Where exactly do I want to go? Who is the person that I want to be? Or who is the person that I am? And so... In order to do that, one of the things that I always teach is, you know, you really need to take the time to put that down on paper, get it out of your head, because I believe it comes to us moment by moment. We realize, oh, I like this. I want to do this. Oh, I'm really good at this. And we have all of these things that are just scattered, you know, fragments in, in pieces of conversation or pieces of inspiration or, you know, moments where we've said it over here, we talked about it, or we've even engaged in it over here or over there. And it's all over the place, but we don't really take the time to gather it and put it in one central location so that we can move forward with it in a collective effort. Um, that's one of the reasons why I believe it's important, you know, to write your own mission statement. And hey, it wasn't something for me that I said that anybody told me I needed to do. It was something that just came to me that I knew I needed to do. It, it just spoke to me. Um, and then going further to find out that all of these other people, as you say, the seven habits of successful people, that all of these people who we look at as these you know, role models and, you know, monuments of success for us. And they're doing it. So there must be some type of principle in it that works, you know, and, and I'm very big on principles. And so that's what the book is. I've just shared a lot of principles from my own life that I know work. The, the awesome thing about this book is it will find you wherever you are. And it works for everyone differently. I told the people in, in Indianapolis when I was there, everyone in the room I don't care if you came with them. I don't care if you're leaving with them. I don't care how long you've known them. It does not matter. But everyone in that room, they can start this book at the same time, but nobody's going to start it in the same place and nobody's journey is going to be the same. Would you walk us a little bit through, like, you know, tell us a little bit about the chapters. Also, I think you said that you locked yourself in a room and kind of downloaded it. Yeah, yeah. please walk us through the book. <laughs> yeah, well, the interesting thing is now, like I said, this book, I've been teaching this and talking this. I mean, this has been my life for some years. Um, I never took the time to put it in a book. So um, after I did my last boot camp, it was said to me, why have you not taken the time to write a book yet? And I said, you know what? After this, I need to do that. So I, I did. I shut myself in my office for seven days and it took me seven days to write this. But the thing about it is it really didn't take time because it was already in me. I mean, it was just sitting down to get it out. But the thing that I love about the way that God gave me this is the way that it just finds people where they're at. It's easy to read. It's it's simple to follow, but it's very deep. I mean, it goes straight to the core of your existence and, and your being and helps to clarify some things because the book is not going to give you anything. That's the one thing I tell people. This book is not designed to give you anything. And although it's considered a self-help book, it's not fixing anything because there's nothing wrong with you. And if you approach 
things from the mindset of there's something wrong with me, then you're not going to get the benefit of what the book is trying to do because there's nothing wrong. Most of us have everything. Actually, all of us have everything that we need in order to be successful as it pertains to our individual destinies. The problem is most of us are going through the process of unbecoming that we might become because we've adapted so many rules and mindsets and and behaviors and ways, um, you know, socially and environmentally and, you know, all of that from different structures and systems. We've adapted those as a part of who we are. And then we get to a certain point in our lives where we find out, you know what, none of this is even me. And so then you go through the process of having to reprogram yourself back to your place of authenticity and originality. And that's what this book helps you do. It helps you go through the reprogramming process. Could you read us a little bit from the table of contents? Yeah. Okay, so from the table of contents, we have, we start out in chapter one, um, and the book is broken up into sections. So chapter one, uh, the first section of the book deals with an empowering mission statement. So it deals with um, developing, you know, a mission, a vision and mission planning guide. Um, and then you have to revise and review it and then you engage it and then you write your own uh, personal mission and vision. One of the things that I know that many people struggle with in writing there, you know, you start out, I don't know where to start. So the way that my book is written, it ask you a series of questions that you answer and you take your time with it. That's the thing I love. You can't rush this. You just take your time with it. You do it as it comes to you uh, naturally and authentically. And then after you, you have all your data, you go back and you review it. And then out of that, there are certain things that just will naturally speak to you and you'll be able to put something together by the end of that chapter that you'll be able to move forward with to speak to the rest of this book. And you won't now chapter two doesn't necessarily connect to chapter one, but it does connect to chapter one. If that makes sense. Um, the book is uh, you'll flip back and forth through the book as you start to do it. Um, then we go, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that, you know, I, uh, I've tried to do this personal mission statement and uh -huh. I found it <laughs> almost impossible. Uh, yesterday yeah. you were, you know, walking me through it a little bit. Would you do that for us? Um, because a lot of people are like, write a mission statement. And I'm right, just like, right. I don't know what to do. But in your case, your methodology is first breaking it down into little parts and yeah, then kind of combining all those parts together. Right. Because I want you to start to think um, one of the things and I want you to start to even imagine for myself. And I borrow from one of my friends, um, Regine Gilbert, who was teaching a class and she shared a piece of it on Twitter. And she said that, you know, we think often we think all the time. We, we've mastered learning how to think, but we don't often imagine. We don't imagine enough. We don't use our imagination enough. And especially when it comes to ourselves. And this is what I want this book to do. I want you to get back to the place of where you can imagine for, for yourself. Um, which means just to image, just to get a picture in your mind of what your life will look like, what your destiny looks like, what success for you looks like. Not what somebody told you, not what you saw on Instagram, not what you saw on, you know, on TV, but for you personally as an individual, what does success look like for you? Um, so I ask questions, you know, what would I really like to be and do in my life? You know, how many people have really just said and really thought, but what would I really like to be and do in my life? Uh, what are my greatest strengths? Uh, how do I want to be remembered? That's a very good one. Um, who are the influences in my life, large or small, and who has made an impact on my life? You know, um, why are we influenced by the people that we're influenced? What is about them by? What is it about them that influences us? You know, what what about us or what about them attracts us to them? Um, what have been my happiest moments in life? And then when do I know that I'm happy? Like, seriously, how many people? I mean, when's the last time you really thought about the definition of happiness for you or when you are really happy, what happiness actually feels like? What is a happy experience for you? You know, um, uh, that's like really deep. I, I feel like nothing, you know, kind of comes to my mind other than, you know, there are these really big moments, but are uh -huh. those really big moments when I'm on stage or whatever? Are those yeah. really the happy moments? So that's really uh interesting that you ask that question. You know, what really is happy? Is it a mm -hmm. good meal or is it, you know, finishing the fashion show or is it landing a big yeah. contract? You know, is it hugging, you know, your mom? What what does that mm -hmm. feel like? Right. That's what Absolutely. you're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then too, if I had unlimited time and resources, what would I be doing? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know? Um, and what are three to four most important things to me? And that's one of my favorite questions, um, especially when I've done group sessions and done workshops. And I ask this question and, and I love seeing the feedback because it's very interesting the things that people really struggle with as far as answering that question because most people the things that they would deem important are really when you ask this question and you start to write it down it makes you look at yourself and say well why is that important why is that is that really important you know but you never these are things you toss around in your head all the time at any given moment most people do not sit and take the time to get this stuff out of their head in front of them so they can actually see themselves and this book helps you to be able to see you. And unfortunately, one of the things that I ran into as far as being a coach is that most people don't want to see themselves because they don't like what they see. And that's okay. Sometimes life does that to you. Sometimes traumas and upsets and all of that, it really has people in a place where they may not like what they see when they look in the mirror. But guess what I love about it is the fact that if you don't like what you see, you can always change the picture. And so this book helps you to change the picture if you are that person. Wow. And then you talked about how some people, you know, it's, it is a, you can do it at the pace that you'd like. And you said a lot of people linger on chapter two. So tell us a little bit about that chapter two where people linger. This is the message. I still get messages about chapter two. I mean, I've had people start the book and go straight to chapter two. You know, they've read, they've looked at chapter one and be like, I have to come back to that. But when they get to chapter two, they're just ready. Like this is, it's just one that speaks to them. But chapter two is um, called I No Longer. And I'll read you, I'll read you uh, the first paragraph of chapter two. It says, when you have arrived at a moment to do what's next, it is important that you bring a completion to what's now. It is key to clearly define what you're leaving, decide what you're beginning, and maximize the moment. After you have gained clear definition and made a precise decision, then you must announce to yourself what time it is. This is powerful because many of us spend our lives based on other people's announcements, what they are allowing and disallowing, and then we adjust. However, I agree with Dr. Maya Angelou that we teach people how to treat us. Sometimes we get stuck thinking, living, and even behaving out of old seasons and cycles because of where other people are. Then we wonder why we're frustrated, agitated, and constantly in a mode of either explaining to people who and where we are or wanting them to just get who and where we are. At some point, you've got to realize you can bring it all to a halt. And then I, inv I give you an invitation. I want to invite you to take an in-depth assessment of your current situation. Compare it to the truth you know about where you should be or where you are wanting to be this time next year. Then write your own benediction, your personal I no longer to this place. Yeah, you talked yesterday <laughs> about the I no longers. Would you, yes. would you tell a little bit about the I no longers? Well, I, I no longer came to me out of a personal place that I was in, and it was actually shared to me um, from a friend of mine, and it was one that uh, Meryl Streep had written, and it went viral online, and everyone was sharing it on Twitter and Instagram. I mean, I was seeing it forever, and one day, it just came to me to write my own. I was actually dealing with a situation with a, with a former client, and I was really aggravated, and I remember we got off the phone, and I was just really frustrated, and I, I started to vent. You know, I, I ended up calling someone, one of my friends that I call and vent to, and I was just venting. And then it hit me. I don't need to vent about this. I've said this time and time again. I've, I've had this conversation over and over. I've said I no longer will tolerate this. I've said I'm tired of this, but I've never really ended that. I've never really shifted and made a decision that I will not tolerate this anymore. And so that's why I kept showing up. So guess what I did? I got off the phone and I sat down and I just went through this, this moment where I just wrote all the things that I was tired of and I just kept going and kept going and kept going. And before I knew it, I finished and I had a whole page of, you know, I no longer is in this notebook and I left it there. And Anina, I never looked at it again until a year later. And it was almost it was almost a year to the day, but it was a year to the week, actually, that I had written it. That I went back and I looked at it and I just started to dissect it line by line and every line that I had written. I could look back over my past year and I was faced with a challenge to see if I really had shifted with everything that I said, because I do believe that, you know, every word is tried and you can say these things. But moments of testing come to prove whether or not you've really shifted in what you said. And when you're you, you write, a, I no longer will, though, sometimes you can't avoid 
you know, yeah. maybe someone in the workplace coming up mm-hmm. and trying to put that I no longer. How then does that shift you responding to that thing that you don't want to any longer? Well, it does just that. I love that question. That's I love how you asked that. That's a powerful question. Um, the reason why it works is because when you make a decision, you do move. You move instantaneously. A moment of decision is a moment of movement. And as soon as you move, the thing is, you can't change a person. And that's what I love about this. This is all about you. It's not. It doesn't have anything to do with anybody else but you. you what you will find is when you move, you'll respond to things from a different place. Wow. I mean, yeah. I guess that's really what it's about is we can't control is. other people, but we can control how we respond to things. Mm-hmm. Because what it really does is it positions you above things and not underneath them. What does that mean? Because most of the things that people write as far as their I no longer, their things, their pressures and their things that people have done to them, their things that they've been sitting under, their things um, that honestly, I, I hate to use this word, but for lack of a better word, they're things that they've been victim to. And when you make a decision to end them and to reposition yourself, then you become the victor and no longer the victim. Wow. Run and so us you through speak. a couple more. How many chapters are in this book? Like, oh, my gosh. That, that only- you could write a whole a whole book on chapter two. I really could. And that's what people have asked me. It's so interesting you say that. People have come to, I've had so many people come to me and say, you really need to do a whole nother book just on chapter two alone. And what happens when you move? I mean, really the, the movement and the results that people are experiencing in their lives. I mean, one of my friends, a very good designer, um, she, her whole business has turned around in a matter of months since she's been doing this book. And she tells me almost every day she'll text me or, or call me with something like, this makes me think about this in your book. And this makes me think about this. And because I was able to do this now, this is happening. I mean, her whole way of living, her whole outlook on life has shifted because of doing this book. And those are the things that matter to me because that's all that I want. I want people to be in a better place when you finish the book than when you started. That's all That's all it's about. If this book does not move and shift you, then I haven't done my job. But I know confidently, just as sure as my name is Elliot, that this book works. It works if you work it. You talk also, I mean, when you look at all the things you're doing, you're working with Fern Malice. It's a very stressful situation. Yeah. She has so many, so many things pulling Wait. at her. <laughs> you also then are speaking. You also have a personal life. And you, mm-hmm. you know, are, are consulting and helping other people like then, you know, how do you personally not get overloaded and what do you do that helps you to keep um, being able to give your best? Um, well, I think that that for me, um, I, I just make sure that because I'm always pulled on, like you said, I'm pulled on a lot. Um, one of the greatest challenges for me has been to learn to say no. <laughs> uh, and I think that's for a lot of us, but that's been a very, very big thing for me because when you're a person who has the heart that I have, and, and especially those who are listening, I think there's so many of us out there in the world who are givers and, and empaths. Um, I think that uh, we we give so much that when it's time for us to be selfish because there is a healthy place of selfishness when it's time for us to be selfish um sometimes we feel guilty for that um and that's been a big struggle for me that i've had to you know get over i'm going to write a book about that too but i've had to really deal with that personally that's been my own but really just staying in a place where i'm very clear on what my assignment is and what my purpose is and knowing Knowing exactly what I'm supposed to give to a situation, a place, or circumstance, or thing, and only give what I'm supposed to give and not anymore. Um, I think too many times we, we get in places where we overextend ourselves, but understanding that, that in giving what we're supposed to give, we are giving enough. And so we don't have to question or feel guilty or live under the burden of, oh, I'm not doing enough. Because I think so many of us, the reason why we're always pushing to go, 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 and give, 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 is because we're constantly feeling like we're not doing enough, not giving enough, not, there's just, We just don't have enough. And so we're always pulling and pushing, pulling and pushing. And that's a big tug of war that you can you can really get caught in in a web. Um, And I I've just learned how to free myself from that. Uh, But for me, you know, simple things, I take long walks, you know, to clear my head. You know, my my days start early in the morning. I start my days usually around 6 a.m. If, you know, on the days I get up, I'll go walking and, you know, walk for an hour just to clear my head. And then when I come back, I take an hour long shower, you know, just meditate and just, you know, allow myself to breathe and think freely and 
and, you know, with no preconceived thoughts or anything, you know, pressing on my mind, but just to learn how to stay in a clear space so that I can hear, so that I can see, because I do know that, you know, by the time I get to the office or by the time I get to my phone, you know, there's there's things that are required of me and I have to produce and perform. And so um, just learning, learning what it takes for me to be in a place where I can maximize in my moment and maximize in my purpose. Um, it just it life just teaches you that. And I think my background in the performing arts, um, you know, there's a there's a saying that the show must go on, you know, so you just learn how to how to keep going and keep doing. And I think over time in my life, I've really mastered that. And, you know, there were a lot of times I've just learned how to smile through things and go through things. But, you know, I, I, if you cut me, I bleed, you know, my feelings get hurt. I'm human. I have, you know, moments where I just don't have it. I have off days. I have on days. I, you know, I have days where, you know, I just don't feel up to it. I, I don't want to, you know, um, that's just the truth. But I think for me being very truthful about those moments and just saying, Hey, I don't have it today. Hey, I'm not in the mood today. Hey, you know, uh, I don't have anything to give you today. You know, you can call and, you know, can we talk about it tomorrow? I appreciate you calling. But right now I'm just not in the space to give you anything. And I don't want to give you anything, you know, that I wouldn't that that's not truthful. Uh, that's not going to build you up. And because I'm kind of in a negative space, I don't want to tear you down. You know, so they're just, you know, truths that I've just learned to sit in. But I think being authentic and real with yourself and, and, and truthful with yourself uh, about where you are at any given moment, I think that will always help you to serve. As long as you're serving people from a place of truth and authenticity, I don't think, you know, it's a battle that you really have to war with as far as, um, you know, are you OK to give to people? or Are you OK to work with people? I think it's always serving out of a place of truth, which keeps you in a place of liberty. One thing you talked about yesterday um, was, and what occurred to me was, you know, that you were speaking to this group of um, designers and we're seeing, you know, Seattle Fashion Week. Now you mentioned Indianapolis Fashion Week. We have Miami Fashion Week. We have, um, oh my gosh, I can't even count them all, you know. We have all these Fashion Weeks and all these people who want to get into the glamorous life of... Um, of fashion and 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 you t I really wonder what it is that you are saying to these um, entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs or or entrepreneurs brands that um, you know can help them you know can some become a Diane von Furstenberg do some want to be that like um, the mm -hmm. the pressure at least from the you know technology industry is so great to, you know, get VC funding, raise a million dollars, scale yeah. your company, <laughs> sell it, IPO it. Like, like you really have to fight that path yeah. that, yeah. quote, everybody takes, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so um, you're, you know, my path may be different than that, you know, and, and this whole thing like in hardware is like, well, you have to do a Kickstarter. I don't know what the equivalence of that really would be in, in fashion, but, um, you know, I know in Silicon Valley here, there's an immense pressure to become big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just what you're saying. Like, I mean, one of the specific things you mentioned was about designers, you know. Um, so, for instance, designers under the pressure because I, I one of the things that I have to say and, and identify is that the pressure and I, I, I know this is with any given industry but the pressures really vary and they vary based on the individual and based on the arena that they may be in or the level that they may be in in their arena I think the the, the pressure some people is financial some people it's it's um, you know the pressure of, of dealing with a racial divide or a racial, you know, barrier um, or diversity and inclusion barrier, which we see is a huge thing in fashion right now, the, the diversity and inclusion conversation. For some people, that's a big pressure that they that they're dealing with. Um, you know, for other people, it's, it's a financial, you know, pressure um, for other people. It's a performance um, pressure. You know, uh, many designers are struggling, you know, with wanting to do a fashion show. You know, it's a pressure to when New York fashion comes, I have to show 
at New York Fashion Week. I have to be on the fashion calendar. Well, it's very expensive, you know. And the question is, you know, do you really have to show? You know, can you just do a presentation? Do you? Why can't you just do an event in your showroom and do, you know, and do market appointments? Or, you know, why don't you not do Fashion Week and do Market Week this year? Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many different, you know, um, decisions that people are under, and it's based on on what they feel the demand is that's on them, which changes every day. I mean, the demand is so crazy now, which is why, you know, fashion is in such a flux. And if anybody thinks they have the answer to anything as far as what's going on with the fashion industry or does anybody have the solution, you know, to help, quote unquote, save the fashion industry as the conversation has been in in the media, nobody has it. Anybody who thinks they know, they they really don't. Um, and, I, and I've spent time reading multiple reports and, you know, white papers and all of this stuff, and they all lead back to the same questions. I mean, people pay hundreds of thousand dollars for these people to do all of these reports, and then you get back to the answer answer is still a question you know so um i just don't think that anybody really knows but um i think that for you as a person whoever's listening a designer or a stylist or you know whatever you may be you really have to decide for yourself what your definition of success is and that will help curb you of some of those pressures that you see other people dealing with that won't even necessarily be authentic for you. For instance, for me, one of the things that, that uh, people have often asked me, you know, you don't have a stylist or you don't have, you know, um, somebody to dress you for events or, you know, you're not wearing this or you're not wearing that. And I'm like, that stuff has never mattered to me. And of course, that's an interesting statement to make since I am in this business, which is all about clothing. And I do care about the business and I understand the bottom line. But for me as an individual, when it comes to, you know, my voice and my identity and who I am, I what I have on, it doesn't really matter like that for me to be in the latest, you know, couture fashions or, you know, the latest, you know, collections off the runway. And even though I know these designers and people are like, oh, you can just, you know, reach out and ask them for this or ask them for that. I'm really not really big on any of that. So, you know, I'm not a label whore, as they would say, you know, so, um, you know, those things just don't matter to me. But for somebody else, you know, that's a big thing for them. And, you know, for them to be presentable and for them to, you know, matter to the world and to the cameras, you know, and all of that, that stuff is part of their flow. You know, for me, it's just not a part of my do. Does that make me any better than them? No, it's just not a part of my authenticity. One thing that is really big here in Silicon Valley that nobody talks about uh-huh. is, you know, that. In entrepreneurs, there's actually a really high suicide rate. And I think yesterday you talked a little bit about how that's also a problem or an issue in the fashion industry. I think you mentioned Kate Spade. Yes. And I mean, we've seen, you know, so and many people, you know, know about last year, you know, Kate Spade committing suicide, which was very, 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 very sad, you know, for the industry where well, anybody committed suicide for anything at any rate, at any place, at any time. It just it does not matter. It's nothing, you know, to be laughed at. It's not funny. It's it's very, very sad. But I think in fashion, we've seen our I mean, we've just seen enough of it. I mean, we've had our share from, you know, Alexander McQueen to, you know, I mean, Kate Spade. I mean, that we've just seen enough of it. I think the issue is that people don't really understand the pressures behind the performance. And so many people, when you have people around you who are always demanding that you perform and you have people who are depending on you for their paychecks and, you know, depending on you for their livelihood, you know, I mean, it's it's really hard to take a break or to say, look, I'm not OK. You know what I'm saying? And I think for me, I I want people to get to a place where if you're not OK, Say you're not okay, you know, and and, and interestingly, Anina, one of the things I've discovered from this book, a lot of the feedback personally and privately that I've gotten from this feed uh, from people doing this book is they they've been able to be courageous enough to share with me that they dealt, you know, depression, heavy depression or even, um, you know, mental health um, issues, you know, where, you know, and the book has been helping them. I had one girl right to me she took my book to her counselor and her counselor she's been seeing a mental a mental counselor for i think she said three and a half years and she told her and she told me that her counselor said that if she commits to doing my book that by the time she finishes my book my book should help her that she doesn't even need to go to counseling anymore and that really was a, a blessing to me because i really really wanted this book to help people like that's that's all like i want you to be free i want you you to be liberated. I want you to be able to think. I want you to be able to imagine. And I want you to be able to do it authentically, uh, conducive to who you are and what you truly want to do in life. And sometimes that means breaking your own rules. And I think that a lot of times that's the place where people struggle because, of, like, I, as I said before, all of the things that have been put on them, all of the rules and the things they 
they've adapted uh, to themselves and a part of themselves that really weren't theirs to begin with. And so I, I, I'll tell you, I start out my uh, boot camps like this. I ask people this question. If I was to give you an apple seed right now, and I'm going to ask you this. If I was to give you an apple seed right now and I told you to go outside and to plant it and you did and you came back inside and I asked you, what did you plant? What would you tell me you planted? What do you mean? Like a tree or I would tell you a plant or I would tell you an idea? What exactly do you mean? No, I no. planted an apple tree. You absolutely did. You absolutely <laughs> It did. And that's the thing that I want people to understand because why inherent in the seed of the tree is the tree itself, right? Yeah. So everything, and I tell people, that's why I started my boot camps because you yourself are that seed. Everything that you need to be who you are, you already have. The problem is you've gone through this, which is why I said earlier about you're going through the process of unbecoming that you might become. So many times we've adapted so many things that are not us that when we get to a place where we realize I've been carrying all this weight, I've been carrying these mentalities, I've been carrying, you know, these pressures and these thoughts and these, you know, responses and, you know, these ideologies that really are not authentic to me, you know, whether they're religious or whether they're, I mean, whatever, however they come from. And then you get to this certain age where you're, you know, you're trying to plow through and you're trying to build and, you know, you have this vision and you have this thing that you know is a part of you that you want to do and you're like, oh, I can't do it because I have this and I have that to think about and then you realize, why am I thinking about any of this? You know, this stuff doesn't even matter to me and then you go through the process of now allowing, giving yourself permission for those things no longer to matter and you'll find out because they never mattered from the beginning. They were things that you just brought along along the way. Wow. Yeah. I remember and in closing, uh, I would love you to share with us the little exercise that you mentioned yesterday about the business plan, about, you know, sitting on a bench. Tell us that story and yeah. let's leave everyone with something really concrete that mm -hmm. they can work on. Yeah. So I, I tell people, you know, the first the first part of this starts with developing your own vision and mission. And some people will say, you know, well, what does that matter? But even I was sharing with Anina on yesterday that even in business, you know, one of the things that I found even in coaching and, you know, doing brand development and all of that. And you find out so many people have these businesses, but or these brands or these ideas that they've launched and, you know, they've gotten a logo and they have all the bells and whistles. And then, you know, you get to a place and they may have, you know, jump started in a moment and been hype and, you know, ran on a trend. And then you get to a place, you know, a year down the road and all of a sudden, you know, everything is falling apart or it's no longer successful or, you know, they're not seeing the numbers and, you know, they're not able to turn over product. And, you know, they're like, well, what's the problem? The first thing I'll ask somebody is, well, let me see your business plan. And then people are like, I never wrote one. <laughs> okay, so how? So where was your plan for longevity? Like, how did you know where this was going to lead? I mean, you started up, you know, in a moment, and you you just launched out into the deep, but you had no plan for for you know longevity. Um, you had no no tangible action items to say, well, when this happens, I'm going to do this. And then this year, you know, at, at this point, I'm going to transition into this, or I'm going to adapt this. I'm going to grow from this point to go here. Most people never have had that because they didn't take the time to write anything down. And that's something that I'm just I maybe old school in my mentality, but I just know that it works. I mean, and so I challenge people to do that for themselves. And the reason why I asked is if a millionaire you left out today and got on a plane or, or sat on a bus or went to the park and, and sat down on a bench. And let's just say, you know, you're you're. I don't know. Let's just say you're a T-shirt designer and you're on your phone scrolling through your website and uh, someone sits next to you that you don't even know and looks and sees your T-shirts and they ask, oh, those are nice shirts. And where, you know, what is that website? And then you share with them, oh, uh, these are actually my shirts. And then that person says to you, well, I'm a multimillionaire and something just told me, as I say, God just told me to invest a million dollars in your business. But I just would like to see your business plan. Most people right there <laughs> will be like. Oh, can I, can we schedule a meeting in two weeks or can, you know, cause we wouldn't have anything and you may not in have Silicon <laughs> Valley. They say, send me your deck. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Send me your deck. Send me your one sheet. Send me something. And you have to have that stuff ever ready. I can't tell you, even for me as a speaker and a coach, I've been, people have uh, reached out to me or come across my Instagram and, you know, or they said, uh, or my website or even seen something I posted on Twitter or even sometimes on LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, but come across something. Don't know me from a can of paint, but, but what I've said has touched them or reached them or, or, or caused them to have more interest in me. And the first thing they say, you know, oh, we're interested. We have this event going on. We love to consider you as a speaker, you know, 
can you send over a one sheet about you know your topics or can you send over you know some of my, your material do you have a press kit do you have you know those are things that you have to have like you have to have these things and they don't have to be in depth they don't have to be long and drawn out because business plans can get very very detailed and tricky and very heavy yeah I don't think you have to have all of that but you do have to have something where you have it outside of you on paper so that people can see it you know and I'll, I'll go here because you know my faith is a big part of everything that I do even the bible says you know to write the vision and make it plain so I tell people you know I just I live by that I believe that you do have to write it down it, it, so that it speaks when you can't make it make sense wow so yeah I would love people to know how to contact you and also you know what do I do if I'm I've ordered your book it's yes. coming today. I'm, oh. I can't wait. Um, my question is, you know, how, how, what do I do if I get stuck? Um, I see that, uh, that you've got also your, um, your Facebook page. Uh, yes. and, uh, you've also got a group. So mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about the best way to reach out to you? so that people can um, ask questions if they get stuck in your book? And where can we find your book? Okay, so um, the book is available at its own website, and it's um, www.trajectifyyourlife.com. Um, they can also go to my website, elliotcarlisle.net, um, which there's a link to go to the book there. And I think when you go to the site, something pops up that takes you to it. So, you know, that that's those are both uh, routes that you can take. Also, you can go directly to Amazon and just type in the Influence Workbook and it'll come right up and you can get it right there. Um, as far as if you're in a place where you get stuck, uh, most people have just contacted me. You know, you, I do answer my DMs on, on uh, Instagram. I am on Instagram and Twitter at Elliot Carlisle. And also Facebook, thanks to Anita, I now have um, a Facebook group, which I'll be getting engaged for um, just that purpose, you know, to help continue the conversation. And I do know that sometimes you can get stuck in this place, especially when you're the only person there. You think you're all by yourself because isolation is or the or the illusion of isolation is such a paralyzer and so sometimes um, I find that I found that if we gather ourselves together among people who are working on themselves in the same capacity or the same place we're working on ourselves engaging conversation there helps us move because sometimes we're dealing with the same question somebody else has or somebody has the answer has already you know navigated the space that we're trying to climb out of and so you know sometimes the the, the place of community always helps in, in enlightening and empowering and liberating and so um, I'm excited to now develop this uh, community on Facebook exclusively for people who have the influence workbook I'm sorry if you don't have it you will not be able to join the group because it will be specifically on material and thoughts and uh, things that come to me from the book and things that people even share and I'll allow people to share their own videos and give feedback and ask questions and you know I'll come live on the book once a, I mean on the group once a week and we'll do a discussion I'm, I'm really excited about using this group to help engage uh, this community of architects. And for those people who don't know, I call my audience architects, people who are actively building dreams, vision, goals, purpose, and destiny. You are architects of your own influence. Elliot, you're such a, a, a wonderful, amazing, positive, you know, oh. motivating yeah. um, uh. person. I'm delighted to have met you. Thank, Thank you, you for spending you. this time and sharing about your book. And we'll post yeah. the links and everything below. And I personally am really looking forward to go through your book. And I'm thank really glad that this exists. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you, Anina. I appreciate you. And thank you, everyone who has tuned in. Thank you so much. I always say time is the one thing that you can't get back. So the fact that you've invested it here today, I pray that you do get a return. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>